Well, good uh, day, everyone, and uh, happy Sabbath. We would like to uh, welcome you to our lesson study. It's lesson number 12, Experiencing and Living the Character of God. Uh, I have with me on the panel, uh, Pastor Ellsworth Baxson, an international speaker from uh, the island of Mauritius, and uh, we are glad to have him on the panel with us. And then from KZN, uh, the uh, pastor there is Pastor Lincoln Deval. Uh, we are all family. Pastor Elsworth is my brother. Pastor Lincoln is my cousin. And uh, I'm Pastor Insler Baxson. And uh, we just like to uh, open now with the word of prayer and invite the presence of Jesus with us. And I'm going to ask Pastor Ellsworth to open in prayer for us. Let's bow our heads and we pray together. Our gracious Lord and Father, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity that you've granted us uh, to listen to uh, your Holy Spirit uh, speak uh, to us and to speak through us. We thank you, dear Lord, for your word that is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who will lead and guide us into all truth. We dare not begin the process of Bible study without asking for wisdom, for insight, and for your Holy Spirit to speak to us. As we reflect on uh, the lesson for this week, dear Lord, the tremendous lesson uh, that speaks to us of the Creator God and also the gift of the Sabbath that He has given us, we ask, dear Lord, that you will open our hearts, open our minds. May we not only understand, but may we apply these truths and put it into practical use in our daily lives. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 For this week's lesson, very interesting lesson, experiencing and living the character of God. Um, I can remember growing up in Cape Town and uh, uh, every Sabbath, you know, we there, there would be somewhere that we went to church, but there were some Sabbaths. Um, that uh, we had a special Sabbaths. Now, Sabbaths, you know, as a child, I, I don't know about you, uh, when you were growing up uh, as children, seemed extra long. Um, but especially so in Cape Town because the sun set so late. And uh, I did not realize it then, but in hindsight, those Sabbaths in my childhood shaped my life dramatically. My father used to take us for nature walks on Sabbath, and I learned to love the Creator through the book of nature. I still love um, hiking in nature up to this day. And this anchored my faith when I, I studied at, at, at university. I studied science. I was not swayed by evolutionary theories. The Sabbath is not just a day of rest. But a university in time, it was learning in the university of the Sabbath uh, that I learned of the Creator and to uh, be loyal and uh, have unwavering allegiance to God. You know, the first thing that we do at church is Sabbath school, Sabbath school. And, uh, and so as we look at the Sabbath and education, uh, on the Sabbath, uh, I pray that we will we will be blessed. Our memory text is is taken from Mark chapter two, verse twenty seven and twenty eight. And he said to them, "The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath." Now, the context uh, to, to this uh, uh, verse, these two verses, uh, is that the Sabbath uh, uh, was a, 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 a bit of a contentious issue between Jesus and the Pharisees. Uh, this text happens on the Sabbath day, 
The Pharisees had just accused Jesus' disciples of breaking the Sabbath. And Jesus' response was, have you never read what David did? Have you never read what David did? And so on the Sabbath, Jesus is taking them to the Bible and he takes the time to educate them from the Bible. Have you read? Have you never read what David did? And he educates them from the Bible about himself. And uh, I'm just uh, going to, to ask uh, Pastor Lincoln if he can um, uh, just mute his mic there. It's, it's a bit noisy. Thank you. Um, so he, 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 uh, he, he, he educates uh, them about himself and how that impacts their lifestyle and, and, and by implication, our lifestyle. Uh, and so we are on the Sabbath. We need to be educated uh, uh, from the Bible. We need to focus on the life and character of Jesus. Looking at the life and experience of Jesus will change our life uh, and experience as well. Our characters will be changed to become like the character of God. So the Sabbath is not just about theoretical learning in the church service. It is also learning by experience. So we can experience and love the character of God. And, and so I'd, I'd just like to ask the panel right now, and you can unmute yourselves as you answer, what is your experience with keeping the Sabbath and, and, and learning on the Sabbath? What's your learning experience on the Sabbath? Can you, can you share some of your personal experiences uh, learning on the Sabbath? Pastor Ellsworth? The Sabbath for me uh, has been a tremendous blessing um, over the years, of course. It changes as you go through the different phases of life, you know, from childhood into adolescence, young adulthood, and then, um, you know, when you are uh, an, a full-bodied uh, adult, and uh, especially when you become a pastor. Uh, Sabbath change for me, uh, of course, uh, my early years uh, in experiencing the Sabbath was a tremendous blessing as well. Uh, and I want to lay emphasis, emphasis on the word experience because it was not just about information. It was not just about theory. It was not just about uh, being uh, within the confines of four walls. It became an experience. We spent time in nature, learning about God. We spent time with uh, people. Uh, we spent time uh, ministering to people as well, whether it was through the pathfinders or through the youth department, uh, going to an old age home, uh, just being a blessing and uh, reaching and touching the lives of, of people uh, became one of the highlights. So. Uh, it was a combination of factors, experiencing God in, in nature, but also experiencing uh, relationships with those within the church family, but also those outside of uh, the church family and above all, ministering to them and blessing them. And of course, having gone into ministry, uh, this has become a key part of the Sabbath because in essence, you know, Every Sabbath as a, as a minister, you are involved in ministering the word of God, being a blessing to people, going to visit people and sharing. And uh, so this is a tremendous blessing for the Sabbath. Thank you, Pastor. Also, Pastor Lincoln, um, your experiences? Yes, I, I of course, uh, appreciate how important the Sabbath is to me as an adult. Um, and, and based on what Pastor Elsworth was saying um, earlier, the, the different stages of appreciation. I, I think the older I become, the more I appreciate the Sabbath. I, I wish 
could speak to the younger me that lived years ago and just to coach and and, and embrace because the Sabbath is everything but boring. Uh, uh, now, as an adult, um, it, of course, there are times when the Sabbath is the most busiest day, but it is a special and unique day for me to stop doing what I do, stop chairing meetings, stop um, with the daily routine and just appreciate a time set aside for my sanity, for, for me to focus and appreciate that God has carried me through another week, that God is able to, to, to receive me and to give me what is necessary so that I become more like him. So for me, the Sabbath speaks and addresses a need in my life, and that is that I um, spend time with a relational God, and I'll touch more on that in a moment, uh, in order for God to change me to become more like him. Thank you, Pastor Lincoln, Pastor Ellsworth. It's uh, it really time time really changes our, our perspective. Um, yeah, because I can remember uh, how the Sabbath used to drag, and I you know, but now the Sabbath is the oh, it's one of my it is my favorite day. I look yeah. forward to the Sabbath, uh, and uh, and and so uh, this uh, is true. Uh, what what Jesus said. The Sabbath was made for us. The Sabbath was made for us, and, and we remember him as the Lord of the Sabbath, and that just enriches our lives. Um, I, I think maybe just to jump yes, in sir. over there, Enslin, uh, to be real and realistic as well. I know we are all pastors here, but there was a time in my life, my younger life, where uh, the Sabbath used to drag a little longer, than I uh, expected or hoped for, and where you know you were waiting for the sun to set, uh, so that you could do other things as well. And I think that might be the experience that some may have had before. That may be the experience that some are going through right now, and they are wondering: Is it normal? You know, is there something wrong with me? Uh, if I'm experiencing the Sabbath in that way. Uh, you know, how uh, how do I understand it and how do I, I change it? So I had that experience before. And uh, it was, you know, because the Sabbath had become a formality, a ritual, a kind of a ceremony, just going along perhaps because uh, my parents took me to church. And as soon as the church was over or as soon as the afternoon program was over, uh, you know, I kept looking at the watch and said, okay, I wonder what's on TV tonight. I wonder, you know, if we're going to have a social event, uh, etc. So my, my focus was not always on the purpose or the goal of the Sabbath, which was about spending time with God, spending time with Jesus and learning about him and developing a Christ-like character. Um, and so this, this is an experience that that i have had before yes and, and 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 that's the key it is a living experience not just a dry formality uh, when you experience jesus there is no turning back pastor lincoln um uh, please speak to us about a time to be astonished the time to be astonished uh, of course and and here's the 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 amazing part that that god the creator god uh the the cre creative creator god um chooses out of love motivated by love creates a beautiful perfect world out of nothing mm. and so he starts the the process um, recorded in, in Genesis chapter 1. An amazing, mind-boggling um, event. First day, second day, third day, fourth day. And, and it seems as if 
as if every day God just becomes more creative. But wait, wait a minute. All this was in God's mind. All this was in God's heart, even before he spoke it into existence. So, so by the time day six comes along, God then does something totally different. Totally different to anything he did in the previous five uh, days. God, in creating man, stops speaking and God starts forming man out of nothing. Amazing. And of course, um, the reason why I introduced this, because the Sabbath is, is created in a perfect world in a perfect environment. There was no yeah. sin. It was just God being his creative self. Now, now I want to say that, that it is impossible. We, we cannot begin to imagine how creative God is. Because let's face it, the three of us and uh, um, the, the church family um, that made it possible for us to be uh, El Dorado Park Church and the leaders made it possible, invited us to be part. None of us can even begin to imagine what the first Sabbath must have been like. Um, today, in an imperfect world, we admire nature, as you shared your, your childhood experiences of the Sabbath. And, and still, in, in, in a sin-sick world, with nature not even being close to to how it was, it still reveals God and God's creativity. Having said that, uh, I'm amazed that at looking at the first Sabbath, there's, there, there are lessons that I believe God wanted us to, to appreciate. That, that here is the beginning of everything on our planet. Everything starts in this creation week. And unfortunately, the Bible just, yes, records chapter 1 and then chapter 2. Chapter 1 goes down um, day by day, understanding God's creativity, just appreciating out of nothing. God thinks it, and then God speaks it into existence. But if, if day 6 was not just the most amazing day, where God creates out of dust and then breathes, does not speak, breathes what is in him. His makeup shares that with this lifeless sand form and man becomes a living being. Just, just so amazing um, that it is recorded in, in chapter 1. Now, Genesis uh, 1, of course, records this. But when we look at Genesis chapter 2, uh, we, we, we look at the same account, but from a different perspective. And, and here's what I found, um, Pastor Enslin, Pastor Ellsworth, and, and uh, of course, um, our church family. The, the, the first Sabbath is the wow factor because God ends his creation. Then God sets a period, a 24-hour period, and what makes this significant, what makes this, the first Sabbath the, the first, the best, the wow factor, the highlight of the week, I want to propose to you that, that everything else centers around the Sabbath because the Sabbath is the first day that God looks back and he says, I'm going to bless this day. This day will be um, just in case, <laughs> just in case you got so um, distracted by the beauty, the, the, the sights, the, the, the creation. I have set aside a day where you can just spend time with the creator, take your attention off perhaps the creation, which just reflects me, but, but enter into a period 
where you appreciate my beauty. Now, here's what, what I really appreciated about this lesson is not, not just do we read about this creative creator, but, but we also then look at the timing. Adam and Eve, Adam created, Eve created a bit later on in the same day. Uh, and then we, we, we read of how it is their first experience. Their first 20 hour period is the Sabbath. Now, Adam and Eve are perfect. They are holy. There's still no sin here. The first Sabbath. Uh, it, it, was, it was God's, the lesson highlights that it was God's opportunity for them to focus on, on the creator of, the, of creation. It, 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 it was a special time uh, where God wanted it to be a time when he could, could spend time with them other than any other day for them to, to spend time with him. But here's why it was time for Adam and Eve to be astonished. Now, now uh, please, please allow me just one more minute because I really believe, and maybe it's only me, um, I, I do believe that I'm limited in my ability to even begin to imagine what that first Sabbath must have been like. But here's the creator longing to connect with the creation, with Adam and Eve specifically. And, and Ellen White says in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 47, God saw that a Sabbath was essential for man, even in paradise. Ellen White says, uh, he needed to lay aside his own interests and pursuits for one day of the se of the seven that that man might more fully contemplate the works of God and meditate upon God's power and God's goodness. So so and then she continues she says man needed a sabbath to remind him more vividly of God and to awaken in man gratitude because all that he enjoyed and possessed came from, from the hand of the creator, <laughs> man. So here's what I want to challenge you with. This wow factor comes in as Adam and Eve appreciate their first 24-hour period, and it is with their creator. God didn't create them on the first day. Uh, it wasn't by chance. It wasn't an afterthought that they were created on the sixth day. It was all intentional um, because God wanted them to learn of the creator first before they got to know the creation. And that for me is so significant that, that before we learn of creation, how it works, how we are to adapt, how we are to survive, we are to, to our, first, our, our first goal, our priority should be to connect with the creator before we, we live and improve our environment. Um, so, uh, I, I still have a challenge uh, imagining what it must have been like. So, last thought on, on this is, here's what we can picture. Picture a newly born baby. The doctor at delivery, the first thing they encourage is the connection with the mother. And that's amazing. Because... Uh, as the eyes, eyesight develops, the, the sound, that little infant newly born, a miracle of God, uh, gets to, to spend time. And the first person that infant connects with is his or her mother. That picture is what makes the Sabbath a wow factor. A time to be astonished that before we do anything, 
we are to enter into a relationship with a relational God who creates us, who created us and sustains us and longs to, to continue just not just every day, but the highlight on Sabbath. So, so Genesis chapter one speaks of that, but then the account in Genesis chapter two emphasizes that the, the naming and acquaintance of God's creation took, took place after the connection with the creator. And that's amazing. I don't know if you guys ever thought of that, but that's what just jumped out at me as, as Adam and Eve just experienced the wow factor. The wow factor was not the creation. It was seeing and being in the presence of the creator. That's what Sabbath should be. Yeah, so Thank of course. Yeah, I think I, yeah, so I, you know, as you were speaking, I just thought of, of when the creator, we know that Jesus is the creator, even when he was in human form and he spoke in the synagogue and the people listened to him, they were astonished. Doesn't the Bible say they were astonished at his teaching? Um, and, uh, and we can experience that uh, as we meet the creator today as well. And perhaps as well, uh, Pastor Lincoln, Pastor Enslin, uh, it's possible that we can lose the sense of astonishment when we uh, keep the Sabbath today, uh, that we it kind of becomes uh, ritualistic. It, we kind of go through the motions and there's no longer the sense of awe, the sense of astonishment. There's no longer the sense of grandeur. We are no longer amazed or bowled over by what God has done and what God has accomplished. And, and perhaps part of that is because we are surrounded by so much secularism, uh, humanism, uh, materialism uh, that tend to focus on man and put the focus on man. And we live in a culture where the focus is often not on God, but is on what man has accomplished and on what man can do. And so we lose that sense of, of astonishment. And so perhaps the question is, if we've lost that sense of astonishment, how do we recapture that sense of astonishment? And, and maybe, uh, Enslin, you were alluding to that when uh, you said, you know, as Jesus preached the word, people were astonished. The question is, what astonished them? It, it, it was perhaps the, the proclamation of God's word. God's word has the ability to give life. God's word has the ability to recreate. And so there's an act of recreation. Well, where the act of salvation uh, is, an, is another reason for us to become astonished at how God can change our lives and hearts and create within us a clean heart or a new heart. And so uh, this, this act is, is, is repeated. It's not just something that happened in ancient history, but as God continues his work in us, we are, we are astonished at what God can do, of how God can change a life from someone who has been lost, someone who has been in the gutters of sin and who now has, uh, who has been saved by God's grace and is living and serving the Lord with fervor, with passion and with power. And so this is a, another sense of astonishment. And that's an important link, I believe, with the original creation uh, that Lincoln spoke about. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Also, then I think we just need to move uh, along quickly now. Pastor Lincoln, yeah. a time for rediscovery. Uh, uh, of course. Thank, thank you for that, Pastor Anson. The, 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 so the Sabbath was introduced right at the beginning. And, and it was Adam and Eve first needed to learn and be educated about the Creator before really appreciating creation. When we get that all jumbled up or upside down or dear Makar, we, we lose that astonishment, the Sabbath. Yeah. It, it's when, we, when the focus becomes about people, about individuals, about material things, what we have, what we wear, the car we drive, and the list goes on and on. Um, 
that's when the Sabbath really becomes a ritual instead of a relationship. And, yeah. and, and when, when we, we look at what God intended, if we have lost our love, our appreciation, if we lost a sense of that wow factor and astonishment, we need to understand that God wants to teach us. He wants to, to guide us. He wants to show us more. And even though we've kept the Sabbath, and there may be uh, uh, brothers and sisters in El Dorado Park Church, and even those who are watching who have kept the Sabbath for years, donkeys of years, but, but, but have they really appreciated the Sabbath? Which brings me to the next part of our lesson. When we appreciate a time for discovery. Now, unfortunately, we are reminded that our circumstances, when that becomes the focus, when the situation and the environment we live in um, becomes so overwhelming, becomes the center of our lives, we, we become like what we focus on. Um, here's why I, I, I say that. The Israelites were held captives. They were slaves in Egypt. And, and years had gone by, years and years, generation after generation, and year they, they they were Egyptian. <laughs> their, their mannerisms, their, their, their behavior, the, the way they thought, they were forced to, to learn the language, the culture. And, and after years, you, you adopt it. You, you become, you, by beholding, you become changed. Of course, it, it, it is true that, that by the time Moses is, is asked to go back and lead the children out of Israel, well, they, they, were, they, they were not Israelites. Um, I, I want to propose that, that, that just as we, we learn new things, we also have the ability to unlearn. <laughs> um, and, and this is the danger. When our, our lives are not lived with intent and and decisiveness, we, we, we lose it. We, we, we lose focus. And, and, and so for all intents and purposes, by the time Moses uh, is, is called to, to lead the children, they lost their identity. They lost their perspective of God. Many of them were worshiping, and maybe by force, okay, maybe by circumstance, but, but they definitely lost their identity and their perspective of God. God knew this. God knows this about ourselves. You see, just because you are Israelite in name does not mean that you have the right perspective of God, nor does it mean that you have a right relationship with God. Uh, let, let me apply it because this may be the very last time I'm, I'm invited to do this, so I might as well say this. Just because you are an Adventist in name does not necessarily mean that you have a right relationship with God. It, it doesn't mean that automatically you have this, this perspective of God that is that matches what God really wants you to appreciate and know about God. So, so this is quite significant, very significant, that God knows this. God sends Moses out, and he knows that, that what he, he had in mind at creation with Adam and Eve was lost by now, that his, his, his children, his special people, his peculiar people were no longer so peculiar. In, in fact, for all we know, they, they even look like the Egyptians. They, 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 they dress like these Egyptians. They, 
uh, well, that's another topic all on its own, perhaps a sermon or a week of prayer. But along comes the introduction of the Sabbath. Man, I, I can't begin to imagine for many who, who kept the Sabbath out of mere habit because it was culture, um, the, the, the Sabbath had obviously lost its, its significance. And so God knows that, that, that he needs to, to just bring back. He needs to teach them. And the Sabbath, the lesson says, the Sabbath is the pivotal learning experience in their journey of rediscovering God and rediscovering who they are. No, no, wait, wait oh, I, I can't um, not say this. If you want to know who you really are, who God wants you to be, then the Sabbath is key. It is the pivotal learning experience in our journey, not just to, 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 to the promised land, be, be, because you, you, you're not going to enter the promised land until you know who you are and start living out your purpose. And, and unfortunately, unfortunately, without judging anyone, looking at myself, if it were not for the Sabbath, we'd be totally, we, we, would, we would have lost our identity long ago. But here's the challenge to those who, who, who now claim to be Sabbath keepers in, and look down at those who no longer, they are called backslidden. We look, we look down at them in judgment. Um, we forget that, that, that God, uh, in, in taking the children of Israel, he, he provides them. Now, the Sabbath is a miracle all on its own. But a very practical way that God does this, and, and we can read about it in, in Exodus chapter 16, uh, verse 14 to verse 29. The miracle of what is this? What is it? That's the question. What, what is it? What is this? That, that's the, the, the miracle. Again, God performing a miracle every day. Every day. They are covered with a cloud during the day and at night, giving them shade and warmth. But God feeds them. God sends them food, the miracle called manna. And we know this. So every day, the manna comes from heaven, enough to feed you. Not, we're not talking about overeating, just feeding. It has all the nutrients, all the vitamins, everything that the body needs to stay healthy. God provides it, sends down. Now, of course, human nature. I'm sure many, if not all, decided, oh, it tastes lovely. It's better than anything we can taste. Cadbury chocolate, anything. It's it just it tastes it's it's divine. So they they put it aside for the next day. Or come now, who wouldn't? And the next day, uh, of course, God teaches them that there's a provision, a provision for every day, and we know this. But 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 it's significant. And very important that we, we remind ourselves uh, about this. On the Sabbath, no manner. <laughs> on Friday, on Friday, preparation day, beloved, on Friday, God sends so much manna and says to them, now I want, to, I want you to, I know you could not collect every day. But on Friday, you need to prepare for the Sabbath. You may collect. <laughs> and it will stay just as fresh as, it, as, it, as if it came down from heaven. Now, now, two miracles were performed. Double food on Friday. And the food did not spoil overnight, unlike the other six days. 
um, that left the Sabbath for the Israelites to marvel at. The, the lesson, the education process is that God will supply all your needs. There's no need to make things a God. There's no need for us to bow down and worship creation. When creator God becomes the delivery, the, the deliver, the deliverer rather, and allows his people to, to experience the emphasis is now not on manna, it is on God. It is not on what God can provide, it is the, the provider, not what is provided, that becomes the emphasis. Hmm. Now, why is this necessary? Because we, like Israel, they, they forgot about it. Before they could enter the, the promised land, before they could could go and represent him, they needed to connect with him. And God had to teach them. And I find that so significant that the Sabbath was the way they could discover, rediscover their God. And that, by the way, is how we should rediscover God if we want to really embrace who we are, our true identity, our true purpose in life, there is no way that we are going to enter the heavenly Canaan without rediscovering that God is the provider and he longs to have a daily relationship that leads up, leads up to the highlight of the week. Of course, Thank you. I can carry on and on, but I realize <laughs> I will stop. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Lincoln. Um, we are going to now ask Pastor Ellsworth, uh, you know, just as, as on Friday, Friday, there was double manna. Um, we need to double time now um, uh, because time is running out. Um, and uh, looking at time for learning priorities, um, Tuesday's uh, lesson and, and, and then followed by time for finding balance. Uh, so thank you, Pastor Ellsworth, for for just uh, doubling time there. Thank you, everyone. I think uh, when we look at the aspect of priorities, the Sabbath has as much to teach us about how we can prioritize our lives. It has much to teach us about how we can prioritize our, our time. So when we look at the Sabbath, number one, you know, the Sabbath is the highlight of the week. It's the pinnacle of the week, the apex it's like the Mount Everest of, of our experience. Uh, but the Sabbath doesn't just come once off. The Sabbath is a weekly cycle. Now, we don't often experience the Sabbath like we should, but the way that the Sabbath should be experienced is it is a preparation through the first six days as we lead into the Sabbath. We begin to, uh, we begin to uh, uh, work towards a climax of the week and we enter into the Sabbath, which becomes a time of revival, renewal, refreshing, um, and, and a time of learning and education where we learn about God, uh, we learn about the character of God, and uh, this is uh, a priority. So number one, the Sabbath becomes a priority because God blessed this day, made it special. In other words, God prioritized this day. And God gave this day as a gift to us to enjoy and to celebrate and to experience him, to get to know Jesus and uh, to prioritize uh, acts, to prioritize deeds that, uh, that place the focus on Jesus Christ, his kingdom, and spreading the good news uh, to those who need to hear it. So the Sabbath is like a fulcrum in time because it's the center beam if you look at a seesaw it everything pivots around the sabbath uh, so the sabbath becomes central uh, unlike like, unlike it is today you know the world prioritizes time very differently but uh, as you all know you know the one thing that we have with us today from creation is the sabbath there's no scientific explanation for the sabbath by the way 
uh, the Sabbath comes from creation. There's no logic behind it. Uh, and of course, we know there's only a biblical explanation for it. God gave the Sabbath as a gift to us. Now, the Sabbath, of course, teaches us that there is something more. When you look at uh, uh, the, the Sabbath day itself, every day of the week, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, you know that there's something more that's coming. And the Sabbath uh, helps us to understand that. The sabbatical year, every year of those seven years, helped us to know that there's something more coming. Uh, then the Jubilee year, every uh, 50 uh, years, we know that it communicated the central truth that there was something more. So the Sabbath teaches us that there is always something more that God wants to give us in life. There's always something more that God has in store for us from a spiritual point of view, for our families, uh, for whatever challenges we're going through, uh, for the goals and the ideals that God has set for us. The Sabbath reminds us that God has so much more. The one who created is still creative and he still has the ability to give us more. And when we prioritize this God, we experience those uh, those blessings. Now, uh, how can we, this is a question perhaps that we can answer, maybe, you know, three or four line answers uh, at this stage. But how can we practically use the Sabbath for teaching eternal priorities? That's a question that I would like to ask. How can we use the Sabbath to teach eternal priorities? Oh, I think that, that that's <laughs> that's a very important question be, be, because for six days we are working, we're laboring, and and that becomes so often what consumes us. We spend eight days at eight, eight hours a day, some even more at work. We we come home, there's family, there's responsibilities, and 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 yet. The focus during that, the, without realizing, may be that because of our time allocation, we are consumed with with the the natural, with the carnal. Uh, we are consumed by um, what what we see, um, and that becomes the priority. Um, yeah, and, and so God. God longs that that yes. Now, to to switch off is 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 our challenge. When, yeah, when challenge. We never have switched off to switch on Friday evening yeah. and and suddenly become now heavenly minded. You know, um, no one can do that, and God knows this. And, and so yeah. I, I believe. It is a real practical challenge, Pastor Elsa. Um, I, I wish I had the answer, except coming back to it being a priority. That in order for me to really appreciate and understand the Sabbath, it must become a priority. And God will teach me that I need to live my life focused on what is eternal. Hmm. Thank, yes, you, thank you, Pastor. Thank you. And and just just quickly from my side, um, yeah, yeah. Matthew six thirty three, um, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. And the Sabbath teaches us to do that. You know, you you may have uh, uh, bills to pay and you know uh, deadlines to meet, etc. But on the Sabbath, um, that is the day that we just seek God and we put all the other things off. And say, God is going to sort that out. I don't have to worry about that. I can rest from that. And that just teaches us yeah. the priority of putting God first. Yeah, that, that's true. Thank you so much, Pastor Ingrid Anselin. And then, uh, you know, very quickly, the follow-up question to that is, you know, what did Jesus place priority on, on, on the Sabbath? If you look at the ministry of Christ on the Sabbath, uh, where was his focus? What what kind of activities was he doing on a, a regular basis on Sabbath? What were they? Everything but sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, the, 
the, the rest comes when we stop focusing on ourselves, on our families, on making ends meet a livelihood, and it becomes service, serving, yes. serving others. And, and that's a key word you mentioned, Pastor Lincoln, because Jesus uh, served on that day. He walked about, whether it was through farm, land, but he was ministering to people, passing through uh, cities, passing through towns and villages, being a blessing, serving people. He was healing people. He was teaching about the kingdom of God. He went into synagogues, but he didn't spend all the time in the synagogues. But sometimes we, we spend all the times uh, hunkered in, you know, church buildings and the community never knows we exist. So the Sabbath is a blessing only for us, but the, the, the community doesn't know about the Sabbath blessing because we're not a blessing to them. Uh, and so some, some, some Adventists, as, when they arrive at church on Sabbath, they leave after sunset and they've not been into the community. And so we need to place priority on what Jesus placed priority, which is being a blessing not only to ourselves or to the church, but to the community. Because the Sabbath was made for man, not just for Adventists or not just for Jews. And we need to show them the joy of service, that we can be a blessing to them, that we can bring healing to them. We can bring hope to them. We can show them the good news of Jesus Christ. So I, I believe this is one of the ways in which we can prioritize uh, the eternal realities of Sabbath as well as the Sabbath experience. So that was uh, Pastor Enslin. That was uh, Tuesday section very uh, quickly. And uh, perhaps just to end off on my section on Wednesday section, uh, Wednesday section is, is a very important one for Seventh-day Adventists because there's one big word that jumps right out and screams at us. And that's the word Lincoln smiling because I think he knows what word that is. The word legalism. Uh, that is a, a big challenge amongst us. Now, we don't have the time to read all the text, but perhaps I'm alluding to Matthew chapter 12, verses 3, uh, where Jesus was walking through the grain fields with his disciples. And they, of course, took some grain and started rubbing it within their hands and eating uh, the, the kernel, etc. And, of course, there were some of the religious elite that were watching, the Pharisees, it's, and uh, who accused Jesus of, and his disciples of breaking the Sabbath. And uh, so uh, this becomes an object lesson for Jesus. Uh, and this was not the first or the last time to teach what the true meaning, the true purpose of the Sabbath was. And often we go wrong as Seventh-day Adventists as well, because the day becomes a day of do's and don'ts. The day becomes a day of rules and legislation. And in fact, we uh, begin to we begin to focus on the rules and not the rule maker or, or we begin to focus on uh, the Sabbath itself and we forget about the giver of the Sabbath or the creator. And so the Sabbath can become an end instead of a means to an end. Uh, and that means to an end, which uh, Pastor Lincoln uh, emphasized rightly, is that relationship with Christ is getting to know Christ. And, and so... When we look at the challenge of, of, of legalism very, very quickly, there are three, three types of legalism. The one is rules with no relationship. So, you know, there are some advent that focus on don't do this, don't do that. You can't, you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to walk too far. You got to keep, you got to keep, uh, you know, uh, you, you can't do the dishes on the Sabbath and, and you can't, you, they have a whole list of, of rules. But there's no relationship with God. So that's one form of legalism. But another form of legalism as well is uh, getting confused between the spirit and the letter of the law. So there are times where we focus on the letter of the law, but we are keeping the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. Uh, like when you are driving, uh, for, uh, uh, you know, the speed limit says on the N1, in Gauteng that you must drive 120 or if you're in Mauritius it is the M1 and the, the, the highest speed limit here is 110 kilometers an hour 
and you are driving on a rainy day, it's, uh, there's torrential rain, and you say, but the speed limit is 110. Uh, so you, you keep driving 110, and you are sticking to the letter of the law when, in fact, it is safer for you in the context of the rain to drive at 60 kilometers an hour. We do that as Adventists. We tend to keep the letter of the law and not the spirit of the law. But the worst kind of legalism is where we, uh, we take God's law, yes, but in a sense, sometimes we set it aside and we have created uh, man-made rules, just like the Pharisees did. There were over 600 uh, Sabbath laws that they have made. And the day can become a burden. So perhaps this is a question I want to just ask my colleagues very quickly. You know, how do we, uh, uh, how do we deal with the challenge of, of, uh, of, of some making the Sabbath a burden? And how can we change that mindset so the Sabbath is not a burden, but it is a delight? What are some practical things that we can do with regards to making sure the Sabbath is a delight and not... You know, people, the first thing people think about is not just a set of rules and do's and don'ts. Um, I was hoping that Pastor Lincoln was going to jump in there first and then I could, you know, piggyback. <laughs> well, I, 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 I was, as, as Pastor Elsot was asking, I was reminded of, of a a quote, and I, I'm not too sure if it will answer it, but, but it does highlight what you're saying. And, and maybe I should, because I think the answer lies in there. Um, how can we make the Sabbath a, a delight? The book Desire of Ages, page 283, paragraph 4. So uh, Ellen White speaks about uh, in Jesus' day and how the Jews had departed uh, from God, uh, the, the focus was on 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 uh, and how the Sabbath lost lost its significance, and and this is what she says. And I, I hope I'm I'm addressing uh, what you're asking. She says Satan was seeking to exalt himself, draw people away from Christ, and he worked to pervert the Sabbath. Yeah, he knew yeah. the Sabbath was a sign of the power of Christ, right? Yeah. She says the Jewish leaders accomplished the will of Satan yeah. by surrounding God's rest day with burdensome requirements. Yes, so, yes. I think we, we need to really do some introspection, my beloved Adventists. We really need to do. We've inherited this and that. And and, and some of us are so indoctrinated that we, we, we are... We are even, we may be misinformed that, that Ellen White said we must do this or don't do this. Um, and we use that. <laughs> let, me, let me jump in there, Pastor Lincoln, because uh, this will shock uh, both you and, and Pastor Enslin. I was confronted in 2017 by a dear believer uh, who wrote a letter and sent it to my office in, uh, in uh, St. Louis, where I was at the time. And I almost fell off my chair because uh, uh, it, this was just after GYD Day. That was the 26th of March. And she said, uh, Dear Pastor, uh, the, 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 the mission of Seventh Adventists has broken the Sabbath because the young people have given out missionary books on the Sabbath. The Sabbath pastor is not for giving out missionary books. And they have done a health, a project as well on gyd day says there are other days pastor for doing health health work this is the sabbath day and they should have been in church on sabbath morning so this gives you an idea as to how distorted perhaps our understanding of the sabbath is and how legalistic perhaps we may have become and we tend to gravitate towards extremes you know whether it's on the left or the right you know how do we keep that balance how do we keep that balance and avoid gravitating to those extremes? And it's just so by following Jesus. Before Pastor Enslin comes in, okay. Yeah. Before Pastor Enslin gives us the real answer. So, so, so the reason why I, I went to that quote, and thank you for sharing that, because 
doesn't that just speak about our attitudes if we don't express it? We, we find fault with everything. So, so coming back to the last one line, in the desire of ages, she, uh, talking about how Satan perverts it, Ellen White says, in the days of Christ, the Sabbath had become so perverted that its observance reflected the character of selfish and arbitrary men. Yeah. Rather, reflecting the character of a loving Heavenly Father. Yeah. We need to do introspection. We become legalistic when the focus becomes, the Sabbath becomes perverted. We, yeah. we are following the will of Satan when, when, we, when we focus on ourselves. You can't do this. You can't. It's all about you. It's all about me. I, when the focus should be on the character of God. And here's where education comes in. God longs that the Sabbath will teach us and we will discover more about him. Right, so let's move swiftly on to Thursday's part of the lesson, a time for community, a time for community. Jesus uh, said in, uh, in first, uh, not in first, in John, uh, John chapter uh, 13, verse 35, by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And so we, we need to love one another. And, and, and it, is a, it, it is in community that we learn to love one another. And the Sabbath provides that space for community um, so that we can learn to love each other. Now, we have heard of blue zones before. You know, those are communi communities with a pattern of, of healthy longevity. People live to 100, but they live healthily. Uh, and uh, one of those blue zones is Loma Linda, and that's the seventh day Adventist in Loma Linda. And the, the one of the top reasons for their longevity, as described in the blue zones, uh, is the Sabbath, um, where uh, they say a weekly break from the rigors of daily life. Uh, the 24 hour Sabbath provides a time to focus on family, God, camaraderie, and this community. Can you see with, with uh, it's, it's community with God, family, uh, and camaraderie. That's with friends and, and, and church family and nature. Adventists claim this relieves their stress, strengthens social networks. Um, you know, sometimes we can, we can um, be on social media and thinking we're strengthening social networks. No, it is in actual community with each other um, that we, that we uh, uh, have a, a, an experience, a living experience on the Sabbath uh, that brings us closer. And it provides um, us with, with that love uh, that we so desperately need. Uh, so community is seen in assembling together uh, on on the Sabbath, uh, and uh, we we see this in the example of Jesus. Luke chapter four verse sixteen, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. So Jesus went to church on Sabbath. That was his custom. He understood the community uh, of assembling together as a church. But community is more than attending church. Uh, when, we, when we read uh, Exodus 33 verse 19, you know, because the, uh, uh, the, uh, the lesson is, is about the character of God and, and, and it's in communion with God that we learn of the character of God. The character of God is the goodness of God. And, and so when we love and experience the goodness of God uh, in community, what does that look like? We can find what that looks like by looking at Jesus, because Jesus loved the goodness of God, especially on the Sabbath. And he got into trouble for it. And this was mentioned already. You know, Jesus would heal on the Sabbath and they would accuse him of breaking the Sabbath when he healed the man with the withered hand or, you know, uh, uh, told the man uh, that was paralyzed uh, for 38 years, take up your mat and walk. 
Um, and, and Jesus answers the critics in Luke chapter 6, verse 9, when, he's, when he says, I have a question for you. Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath? Or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or to destroy life? And so as we, we, we look at community, uh, as Pastor Alphas mentioned just now, it's not just a church community, but it is the community beyond where we need to live and experience the character of God. And that's the goodness of God. That's why we must do good on the Sabbath, uh, do good yeah. to others. Uh, Ellen White in my life today um, says the Sabbath is not intended for the, the not intended to be a period of useless inactivity. The yes. law forbids secular labor on the rest day of the Lord. The toil that gains a livelihood must cease. No labor yeah. for worldly pleasure or profit is lawful on that day but as god sees this labor of creating and rested on the sabbath and blessed it so man is to leave the occupations of his daily life and devote those sacred hours to healthful rest to worship and to holy deeds the work of christ in healing the sick was in perfect order with the law um, it is uh, it honored the Sabbath. And so it is as we do holy deeds, there are there is holy work, you know. So we as pastors can work on the Sabbath um, uh, because that is holy work. Um, and, uh, and, and so all who play a part in the church service, or all who do um, missionary activity, doing helpful services, that is holy work on the Sabbath. And that is very good community work. And, and so I just uh, uh, like to, to uh, throw out a, a question with a half a minute answer from, from each of you. How can we help others to experience the sense of community that God intended on the Sabbath? How can we help others to experience that sense of community? Pastor Elswood? I think one of the ways, and we struggle, we struggle with this. I mean, I see it. I know where you are. You see the same thing. Firstly, within the church, we have Sabbath school. We have action units. But many times, and I've had many members speaking to me saying that they're not connecting with people because there's no opportunity for sharing, for developing uh, deep relationships, uh, spiritually supportive relationships. Uh, where they are able to connect with people on a, a deeper than a superficial level. So one of the things we can do in uh, in helping our members to connect is creating platforms and for action units is one of them. Uh, uh, home home group meetings, uh, social meetings, um, uh, where people come together, share together, pray together, encourage each other, building accountability. Um, and providing opportunities where people's lives can inter, inter, interact together. So that's one of the ways in which that can happen. Um, perhaps somebody else can comment on, on uh, another aspect. Thank you. Pastor Lincoln? Probably just one word. Uh, others. Uh, mm. Others. Uh, there, there's a, a, a hymn, old hymn, that, that challenges us. Our focus should be on others. Um, I, I, our, our greatest temptation is to be so self-aware, self-conscious, that that um, causes us to lose the, the joy, the blessing of the Sabbath. Christ showed us it was about others. Mm. When we become... And I don't know where we've adopted this tradition as Adventists that Sabbath is about focusing on ourselves, feeding, educating, training, learning. Yeah. And we become spiritually fat and obese. Yes. And we do for nothing, not even for ourselves. Others. You <laughs> So, yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. And now, uh, Pastor Lincoln. Um, uh, something as we wrap up. Wrap it up. <laughs> yes, uh, something you mentioned that I really appreciate is the, the Sabbath and the holiness. Uh, Spirit of Prophecy 
uh, says uh, the Sabbath is a, a golden clasp that unites God and his people. Now, uh, we, all, we know that the Sabbath command has been broken. The, uh, God's holy day uh, has been desecrated. And, and uh, Isaiah uh, 58 says, if you will just keep my day holy. So, so, so the Sabbath becomes a token that, uh, the lesson says, a, a token of, of the fact that we've separated ourselves from idolatry and we are intentionally connecting with God. Again, relationship. God wants to teach us something so beautiful. But in order to keep the Sabbath holy, we must become holy. Now, let, 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 let me be the first to admit I, I've tried it. I cannot make myself holy. The more I try, the more I fail. God uh, receives me in the condition I am, realizing, helps me through His Spirit, Holy Spirit, to realize how worthless I am, how sinful I am, and He receives me in that condition, hoping that the Sabbath would, would, would help me to understand and guide me. So the Sabbath is a sign of God's power to make us holy. And Amen. I pray that we would allow God to make us holy. That is my prayer for, for God's people, all Sabbath keepers. My challenge on God's holy Sabbath, let us allow him to make us holy. Shall we Amen. pray? Heavenly Father, I commit every Sabbath keeping Christian to you right now. I commit them to you, Lord, because you have the power to free them from tradition. You have the power to free them from the legalistic mindset and lifestyle and to give us the ability to experience freedom, joy, delight, in the Sabbath, but most importantly, the transforming power to, to make us holy. Lord, help us. For many of us, we have missed the mark. The Sabbath can become a day of discovery, a day in which you want to teach your children before it is too late, that the Sabbath is not a burden, but a blessing. As we enter into this deliberate decision to live for you, may your character be revealed. And may the Sabbath keepers become a blessing to those who are yet to experience the joy and blessing of observing and keeping your commandment and honoring and remembering the Sabbath day. So, Lord, please come and do for us what we cannot do for ourselves, is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. As Christmas Eve hours were approaching, Barna Magarasi could already smell the aroma of all the cakes that were being baked in neighboring homes. He lived in communist-era Romania during the 80s, and unfortunately, that pleasant smell would not be filling his apartment that night. Aren't we also having something special for Christmas? Barna asked his mother, Genevieve. I haven't yet found a recipe for making a cake with just two eggs, she answered disappointed for not having the essential ingredients to prepare a treat for her children, she went into another room, closed the door, and cried to God for help. Like the poor widow, she had been faithfully putting God first, returning her tithe even during the most difficult times. Believing in His promises and that He would provide for her family, she felt peace in her heart. A few minutes later, one of the neighbors knocked on her door and asked if Genevieve had two eggs she could borrow.
because she didn't have enough for her Christmas cake. Moved by the principle of putting God first, others second, her desires last, and trusting in God's provision, Genevieve gave the neighbor the only cake ingredients that she had. She was happy to help, but her heart was aching for her three children that were hoping for a cake that evening. Fifteen minutes later, a stranger knocked on their door. He introduced himself as someone grateful to Barna's father for a great help that he had received from him during the summer. The man told them that he felt a strong desire to bring them some oil, flour, sugar, and eggs that morning. Coincidence? Definitely not. There is someone who knows everything, who is able to give us our food in due season, who opens his hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. Barna Magarossi is now the Executive Secretary of the Inter-European Division. As you worship the Lord with your tithe and your promise, pray for a growing trust in His supernatural ability to supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. May we put our desires last and God first. Oh
Thank you very much, Brother Russell, for the welcome to this pulpit. Knowing that this is December and it's a season, you know, very important to many people, especially when they celebrate uh, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, which did not happen on that day. But in line with the festivities of this month or the season, I thought I'll share a few thoughts around that theme for this morning. I'd like to express my appreciation to you, and I'd like to start with the leaders and the officers of this year. Our stay on this planet is overdue. It's time for us to really long to be home with Jesus and all the redeemed of all ages. This is my longing. This is what I live for. So long as I live, the servant of the Lord says, I desire to keep Christ in view. This is my life purpose. And I'm going to, by God's grace, allow nobody or nothing to deter me. Remain focused. Because this is for sure. And this is the better or the best option that we could maybe go for. So thank you, leaders. The Lord has led us with a mighty hand. He kept us by His grace. It could have been worse. And here we are, healthy, while so many have succumbed to this dreaded and deadly virus. Not, I don't want to go into what is happening around the world, but the Lord has been good to us at El Dorado Park Church. The future might have tremendous challenges, but the Lord of all times is more than a match for every single one of it or challenge or situation. And what may appear to be dark, uncertain, and impossible for man, and we may even see ominous clouds. Let us trust the one who holds the future, who knows everything about the future. So we thank the Lord for His mercies and His goodness and His grace. Thank you, members, also for your part and your determination to hang in there and endure unto the end and finally receive the prize which is in safe keeping. Just before I announce what I'm going to talk about, I've given a hint already by reading the text in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 15. Let me just briefly give some background to this occasion. You know, sometimes people do things and they don't know why they're doing it. It's because others are doing it. It's because part of the culture. We grew up. This was passed on to us. Therefore, we are doing it. The actual date of Christ's birth is not known. That is good. Just imagine if people around the world had to know that Christ was born on the 25th of December and celebrated the way they do. It would have been said. The actual date of Christ's birth is not known. December 25 is observed by most Protestant, Protestants and Catholics, Roman Catholics. The Orthodox, Orthodox churches observe the event on January 6, whereas the Armenian Church has selected January 19. By the end of the fourth century, December 25 was generally accepted as Christmas Day. The year 4 BC is usually accepted as the time of the birth of our Lord. The word Christmas is made up of two words, Christ and Mass. This represented then a mass of religious service in commemoration of the birth of Christ. 
customs associated with Christmas have uh, come from many parts of the world. The Romans were the first to give presents as a gift or as part of the celebration. The Christmas tree with its evergreen symbolizing eternal life came from Germany. The mistletoe came from the Druids and holly was the contribution of England as well as scars and plum pudding. The idea of hanging a stocking came from France. The Scandinavian countries contributed the Yule or Yule log, and Holland gave us St. Nicholas, later called St. Claus. So, this is what will be celebrated on the 25th of this month around the world. And we know as a fact that that is not an actual accurate date on which Christ was born. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The title of my presentation here this morning is The Greatest Gift of All. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. What is the best Christmas gift you have ever received? You remember? How many of you like gifts or presents? Let me see. Let me see. Only one person here. <laughs> only, only two persons. Only two people? All right. I suppose the rest are fond of giving gifts. Dishing out dish, their gifts and stuff. Today I want us to consider the greatest gift of all. Paul, since chapter 8, has been talking about giving of our resources. He has pointed out the generosity of the Macedonians and encouraged the Corinthians to be generous as they gave to the Jerusalem offering. That is just a backdrop to what we are talking about. As he concludes his teaching on giving, like always his thoughts uh, take him to Christ, which leads to an outburst of excitement and praise. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. I can see Paul contemplating the great truths of the indescribable gift when in Christ, or given in Christ, he is a little more than enthusiastic. He is jumping up and down, maybe he throws his hands up and shouts as he writes, Thank be to God for the indescribable gift. This particular word is found only here in the New Testament. Paul reaches for a word to describe and the only word he can find there or come up with is indescribable. You cannot describe it. Have you ever tried to describe something about which you were so excited you couldn't find the words to describe it? It is the greatest gift of all. Now, you know, I have a few, 11 at least, translations of the Bible which I just put together just to see what they have to say on this one. The King James Version, the New King James Version, the New International Version, the New American Standard Bible, as it this way, the indescribable gift. Then the New Living Bible, too wonderful for words. The New English Bible, beyond words. The Revised Version, unspeakable gift. The English Standard Version, inexpressible gift. And then the Amplified Bible, a gift precious, beyond telling. His indescribable, his inexpressible free gift. And then also the Afrikaans Bible. What, what is your guess if you come to Afrikaans? What did you think? The unexpreklike, it's unbelievable, isn't it? The unexpreklike gave. And then the clear word puts it this way. His indescribable gift, a gift of grace so undeserved. 
Do you really believe that we don't deserve this gift? Paul reaches this word to describe something that is very precious to him. Now, the greatest gift of all is mysterious. What do you think when you hear the term mysterious gift? Perhaps you think of a white elephant gift that you got at a party. It may bring to mind that gift which an aunt sent you uh, one year, uh, which you have never figured out. If you travel a lot, you may think about a strange package that has been left in a corner. When I speak of a gift being mysterious, I am speaking of a gift that causes a person to be filled with awe and wonder. It is a gift that eludes comprehension and explanation. When you consider the gift of the incarnation, the coming of Christ into the world, the feeling should be of awe and wonder. Because this was the only acceptable gift. Sadly, the story of the incarnation has become so commonplace. It has been stripped of the mysterious. In the following poem by Augustine, some 15 centuries ago, he attempts to capture the mystery of the incarnation. We will never grasp, understand, not even to mention, fully understand the incarnation. This is what he's trying to say. Maker of the sun he is made under the sun. In the Father he remains. From his mother he goes forth, creator of heaven and earth. He was born on earth under heaven. Unspeakably wise, he is wisely speechless. Filling the world, he lies in the manger. Ruler of the stars, he nurses at his mother's bosom. He is both great in the nature of God and small in the form of a servant. I'd invite you to rekindle the mystery of Christ. Let your heart be filled with wonder and awe of what God did that first Christmas. Let the wonder of Mary, the mother of Jesus, fill your heart. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart according to Luke chapter 2 and verse 19. Secondly, the greatest gift is miraculous. Miracles have fallen into disrepute. And in our secular culture where we can come up with a logical answer for every happening, there is little room for the miraculous. Yet, According to a 2008 study by the Pew Forum, 79% of Americans believe in miracles. There is no miracle greater than the incarnation. It's beyond our reasoning. Think of all the, mir the miraculous things that happened that first Christmas. The Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled. The Bible says in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, But you, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. Fulfillment at the birth of Christ. Angels, angels visited Mary and Joseph on separate occasions. An angelic choir appeared to a group of lowly shepherds. A star, unlike any other, appeared in the sky and led the Magi to the Christ child. There were visions and dreams. The mother was a virgin. But none is bigger than this. This child was Emmanuel, which being interpreted means God with us. This is what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. 
this child was the infinite God man. There is no logical human explanation, and try as you may to explain Emmanuel, it is a miracle. Our minds are too small to fully grasp what transpired when Christ became one with us, one like us. The greatest gift of all is magnificent, number three. This gift is magnificent because it provides peace with God. Just think about it. We are now at peace with God because of this gift sent from the Father. This gift is magnificent because it provides peace with God. This gift is magnificent because it promises forgiveness of all our sins collectively. This gift is magnificent because the Bible says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sin. That is Matthew 1 verse 21. This gift is magnificent because it brings eternal joy. What would we have been had it not been for Christ and what he has accomplished on our behalf? Where would we have been? Hopelessly lost, eternally lost. And for this reason, the Apostle Paul could find no other word but indescribable gift. This gift is magnificent. Because it meets your deepest needs and longings. This gift is magnificent because it sets you free from bondage and slavery. You don't have to be a servant or a slave of the devil any longer. Christ has come and he has set us free. The gift is magnificent because it catapults us into the love of God. This gift is magnificent because it brings us into the presence of God. If you listen to what I mentioned in the opening prayer, it is because of Christ and because He is worthy. And for that reason only can we come boldly before the throne of grace. This gift is magnificent because it keeps giving for all eternity. I'm going to preach to you one Sabbath in the year 2021, the Lord willing, about eternity. To give you an idea as to how, it, how long eternity is. Not a single individual can guess how long eternity is. How long is eternity? Huh? I can't hear? You're not sure? This gift is magnificent because it keeps giving for all eternity. Throughout eternity. The greatest gift of all, number four, is matchless. There is no gift that compares with the gift of Christ. Nothing on this planet. Christ is so precious. The best Christmas gift that you have ever received pales in comparison to give God, to the gift God gave that first Christmas to you and to me. You know the 1,000th chapter in the Bible, which chapter is that? Chapter 1,000 in the Bible is John 3 verse 16. I want you to recite it with me, please. For God... This monogamous son, only one of a kind. There's never been a birth like this. There's never been a gift to this planet as it is in Christ. The only acceptable gift because that was according to the agreement. Chapter 1000 and verse 16. You know, you don't have to... It'd be uncertain and question what I'm saying to you. you. Even Google will tell you this. You can ask Google anything. I've been doing this for a long time, you know, knowing that uh, John 3 is chapter 1001. Uh, so I checked on Google, they, they, they join in. Anything. And, and never disappointed. If I have a query and, and I want to be sure about something, I, I consult Google, and Google is really on the ball. 
Number five, the greatest gift is measureless. During the Christmas season, stores will run special sales with this little disclaimer, while supplies last. But now, I haven't seen people here from the Eldorado Park Church. They're not fond of bargains at bargain stores, huh? They don't go early, queue before they unlock, open up the doors. They, you don't do that here in Johannesburg. It happens in Cape Town, Port Elizabeth, Bloemfontein, other places. Not in Johannesburg. What they are offering is in limited supply. That is not the case with the greatest gift of all. There is no disclaimer while supplies last. This gift is measureless. All who ask for this gift will receive it. He won't impose himself upon us. We have to indicate a willingness to receive him. Now I'm concluding. The gift of Christ is the greatest gift of all. Have you received it? You know, sometimes I wonder and I ask myself, judging by the performance of how people relate to others, even fellow Christians, if Christ really and indeed makes his abode in their hearts. Now, pardon me, I'm not speaking to anyone specific here. It's a general statement. You maybe know what I'm talking about. Have you received it? Do you possess it? How is Christ going to feature in your program this busy time and season? I recommend to you, therefore, brethren and sisters, heaven's gift to man because it is also the incorruptible gift. I remind my boys every time I give them gifts, Remember, it is nothing compared to what Christ offers and what he can give. I remind my boys, whatever I give you has no eternal value except for the fact that I've introduced you to Christ. I've given you the best. I've had the privilege to baptize my four boys. I pray for them every occasion, in their presence, in their absence. Because I believe what Christ did on our behalf was a precious gift given to us in order to reclaim us. God's gift to you and to me is for us to have it forever and forever. There is nothing we can take from this world. It may be of sentimental value to us. If me, you may have sacrificed in order to, you know, obtain it. But you cannot take it with you. The Bible says we came naked into this world. It is clear that we'll make our exit leaving everything behind. There is no way we can take it with me. So I'd like to propose to you. If you haven't accepted the Lord Jesus Christ fully, if you have not reflected His light, His love, His character to people around you fully, if you've let Him down, try again and make amends for maybe where you slipped up. No man can have it or take it away from you once you have received it. It was given to you. It was given to me out of love. If I depict to you Christ suffering on that cross, which I did the last time, I'll maybe just refer to some of those things again. Just think about it. The subject of derision and humiliation, as if he was nothing, discarded, disregarded, not reckoned, but you know what? His mission 
was to come and save. He was out here on the rescue mission. The Bible says in John chapter 3 and verse 17, God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. And this is the message that we have to carry forward. It's going to be my own fault one day if I find my, myself outside of the holy city. It's going to be my own fault, my own decision, my own choice. He was born to suffer, to die, a substitutionary death, yes. They did everything to belittle our Savior. And remember, his death. Whether I accept it or not, whether I take it for granted or not, will not be in vain. There's got to be someone wise who will accept, have the intelligence and wisdom enough to accept this gift on offer. He died ignominiously, but thank God he is alive today. We can say and we can sing, we serve a risen Savior. And one day soon, he has promised, he will come again. Yes, the Son of God paid the ransom with his life so that a lost sinner like me could be reclaimed. I sometimes wonder, what if this message hasn't come my way? Where would I have found myself in the sinful will today? Excellent accounts are given about Christ's rescue mission, the plan of salvation. It brought freedom. Don't you understand? You know, in George, when I passed it there, they had a saying there. They were joking about this uh, with reference to freedom. Are you free or are you dumb? We don't have to be the slaves of Satan or the devil. We are free. According to 1 John 5, verse 11 and verse 12, if we have the Son, we have life. If we don't have the Son, we don't have life. Christ has to be a part, an associate, a partner with us in our walk, our sojourn on this planet. Have you received this gift? The greatest gift of all, by way of revision, mysterious gift, the miraculous gift, the magnificent gift, the matchless gift, the measureless gift, those five things. If you remember it, you've got it. And we cannot improve on that. I sincerely pray and trust, friends, brethren and sisters, that you show appreciation of what Christ has done for you this festive season. Do as Paul is exhorting the Romans uh, to do in Romans 12 and verse 1 and verse 2. Maybe we should end off by reading it. Romans chapter 12, and I read the first two verses. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed or fashioned according to this world, but be he transformed by the renewing of your mind, that he may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Don't get carried away by the stream of the season. Many a young man lost his way by just being, you know, in a mood of celebration. Carried away, lost his way. And the servant says, no man comes to a sudden fall. It is a gradual path we tread on until the, the devil, the enemy, he finds an occasion to come in between. May he protect you. May he watch over you. May you cooperate with him. And may God be with you all during this time of refreshing. Enjoy every moment and return determined to continue in the way of the Lord. May you enjoy this festive season. Like never before, make a point of it that you are going to prepare like never before, at any time, in the state of readiness to meet the Lord and Savior. This precious and indescribable gift 
so that we can be with him throughout eternity. God bless you as he blesses your families also. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for this indescribable gift. In the person of your Son, Jesus Christ, who was willing to come and save sinners like all of us here before you. But Lord, we appreciate that gift. We have reached out, realizing that it is only that as we abide in Him, have we got the guarantee of eternal life. And there is no way that we can afford to miss out. You've been wonderfully good to us over this past year. You have promised to be with us alongside under all circumstances. The going may be tough, sometimes maybe even unbearable. Sometimes it may lead us to the point of despondency. Sometimes we may even feel to quit. But Lord, help us to hang on. Our salvation is now nearer as when we believed the first time. Therefore, keep us faithful as we don't allow space and occasion for the evil one to come in between and snatch us away. May we always be on our guard. Exercise the presence of the Holy One so that we don't sin against him deliberately. Be with all these under the sound of my voice during this festive season. Keep them safe for those who may travel and maybe visit with family members. May your abiding presence accompany them wherever they go. May they arrive in safety every single destination. And in accordance with your will, bring us back here next Sabbath and for the rest of the time, the duration of our stay on this planet on this side of the kingdom, determined to endure and be found faithful, and then because of your grace gain access into your eternal kingdom. May this be our experience as we look forward to it with longing. Save us, Lord. Without you we are lost, and we cannot and do not deserve to live. Thank you for accepting our worship. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for enthusing us, giving us the strength and whatever we need to continue in this way. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Mix 
Jesus alone. 